Sigil is the primary city of the Planescape campaign setting. And yes, it is pronounced Sigil. 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 Ooh, and then we got Sigil! Lowercase s, Sigil, as in an inscribed or painted symbol considered to have magical power, and uppercase s, Sigil, as in the city, are not pronounced the same, though they are spelled the same. Sigil, meaning glyph, has a soft G, and Sigil, the city, has a hard G. I'm very sorry to all of you who are bothered by that pronunciation and stand by the soft G, but that's how I'll be pronouncing it in this video. And I'm going to say it 188 more times. But like all pronunciations, it doesn't really matter how you pronounce it, as long as the players at your table are fine with it. But I do personally like it being pronounced sigil because it makes it very clear that we aren't talking about a sigil, which is a word that definitely gets used while playing D&D. A sigil of <gasps> teleportation. But that is no sigil. I'm a sigil, if you will. <laughs> and because the weird pronunciation delivers on some of the intended weirdness of the Planescape setting. And for this video, as usual, I'll be primarily using 2nd edition material, because that's the edition Planescape is originally from and where most of the material is found. But I'll also be using other editions when they have something to offer as well. For the most part, that just means 5th edition, as 3rd and 4th edition don't really have a whole lot of information on Sigil as the Planescape campaign setting was discontinued going into 3rd edition, and wasn't revived until 2023. Sigil is the city at the center of the multiverse. Not literally, though, as the third rule of Planescape is that the center of the multiverse is wherever you happen to be. But Sigil is often viewed by its inhabitants as the center of the multiverse due to the fact that it seems like it's connected to everywhere through its incalculable number of portals, making it, at the very least, the crossroads of the multiverse. Sigil does, though, have a central position in the Great Ring, also called the Great Wheel, which is the formation the Outer Planes take. The Outer Planes, by the way, are basically the afterlives of D&D, and if you don't know about those, then I recommend watching this video first. The city floats atop a spire of infinite height in the center of the Outlands, visible despite the spire's height, because an important thing to learn about Planescape is that nothing makes any sense. There are 15 factions vying for control over the city, and it's divided into six wards. The Clerk's Ward, the Ladies' Ward, the Lower Ward, the Market Ward, the Guildhall Ward, and the Hive Ward. And then there's also Under Sigil. I'll describe all the wards in depth much later in the video, though I would broadly describe the residents of the Ladies' Ward as the Elite Class, the Clerk's Ward, the Upper Class, the Merchant and Guildhall Wards, the Middle Class, the Lower Ward, the Lower Class, and the Hive Ward, the Lowest Class, and Under Sigil, even lower still. Sigil exists in a giant torus. The Harmonium, one of the factions of Sigil, have measured the torus to have a 5 mile diameter and a 20 mile circumference, which also doesn't make any sense. Though it could make sense in hyperbolic geometry depending on the curvature of the plane. 4th edition says that the diameter is 6.4 miles, and that does make sense with a circumference of 20 miles. A rare win for 4th edition. Or maybe the non-Euclidean numbers in 2nd edition were intentional to play into the surreal nature of the setting, and this change in 4th edition is actually Wizards of the Coast missing the point in not understanding what makes Planescape Planescape. Typical 4th edition. In any case, Sigil's measured size doesn't actually matter much because, like really all places in Planescape, it doesn't actually have a fixed size. It fluctuates at the whims of the Lady of Pain, the enigmatic ruler of the city. Sigil is built on the inside of this giant hollow torus, shaped like a smooth car tire so there's an opening around the inner band. Honestly, up until making this video, I thought Sigil was built on the inner ring but still the outer surface of a solid torus, like this. So if you imagine a ring that you would wear on your finger, the part that touches your finger would be the surface Sigil is built on. I thought this because, well, that's how a lot of art depicts it. That's how it looks in Planescape Torment, and I suppose because that's how I read the 2nd edition descriptions of Sigil. So if you were in Sigil, and you looked around, you'd see the ring stretching upward, say in front of and behind you, but only in a band a few miles wide, like this art. But while reading 3rd and 4th edition material, and looking at this map, and this map, I realized that these editions have it that Sigil is built on the inside of a hollow torus with an opening in the inner band. So that if you were in Sigil and you looked around, you'd see the city stretching up behind and in front of you, 
but across your entire field of view, too, not just in a band a few miles thick. And there'd be an opening somewhere where you can see the empty sky, and then you could see across through the empty center of the torus to more of Sigil on the other side. Honestly, it's much harder to conceptualize than the solid ring model, and I'm not sure I prefer it, as while it does feel much more confined, which is fitting because one of the city's names is the cage, it also means you can't walk completely around the city's curve, or at least one of its curves. There's a gap in the inner circumference where the torus is open. So if you want to get from here to here, do you have to walk all the way around like this? Or perhaps there are services that fly you across the gap, though if there are, they're never mentioned anywhere. Or of course you could rely on portals. Anyway, I wanted to know if the 3rd and 4th edition model was really a change, or if I had just misread 2nd edition descriptions. So I went back and carefully reread them, and while they aren't as clear as they could be, this is actually how 2nd edition describes Sigil as well. Imagine a tire, no hubcap or wheel rim, lying on its side. Sigil would be built on the inside of the tire. All the streets and buildings would fill the curved interior. And a car tire is hollow with an opening in the inner band. Though honestly, I think either model of Sigil is fine. Just use whichever one you like better, because from the art, it kind of seems like D&D itself does the same. Sigil is also known as the City of Doors, the Cage, or according to 4th edition, the City of Secrets. It's called the City of Secrets because the place is so vast, so ancient, and full of so many creatures from all over the cosmos that anything that can be known can be found here somewhere. It's called the City of Doors because it contains so many portals leading to and from other parts of the multiverse. These portals are the only way into or out of the city. Well, except for a select few teleportation circles in the city. This means that you cannot enter Sigil using the plane shift or gate spell, and no magic items, such as cubic gates, can get you into Sigil. Unless, of course, the DM makes an exception because they want to be cool or mysterious. You also can't get into Sigil by climbing the spire in the Outlands or by trying to fly up to it. You'll just never get there. And it's called the Cage because the portals can be elusive and unpredictable, which can make the city hard to get into and hard to leave. These portals are controlled by the Lady of Pain. She has the ability to lock down the entire city, closing every portal. Also, most portals require gate keys to be activated. Gate keys, also called portal keys, aren't necessarily physical objects, though they often are. They can also be passwords, or memories, or even particular states of mind. They often have some thematic connection to the portal's destination, such as a white lily for a gate to Elysium. So to travel by portal and sigil, and thus leave, you not only need to know the location of a portal and have a pretty good idea that it won't take you somewhere horrible, like the 66th layer of the abyss, or better yet, know exactly where it leads, you've also got to know what the portal key is, and then get yourself one. There are three types of portals in Sigil. Permanent portals, temporary portals, and shifting portals. Permanent portals are what they sound like, and they're often concentrated around the headquarters of the various factions of Sigil. Temporary portals appear and disappear at a whim, perhaps never to be seen again. These portals seem to pop into existence to further the Lady of Pain's inscrutable goals. So if a portal spontaneously appears before you in Sigil, it's probably because she wants you to use it. But that might not be a good thing. Shifting portals are those whose ends change locations. For instance, a portal might lead from the Clerk's Ward to Mount Celestia today, then shift from the Clerk's Ward to a location in the Market Ward for a few days. Then maybe the other end shifts from Mount Celestia to Pandemonium. Shifting portals usually follow a sequence, but sometimes those sequences are so long or complicated that nobody has ever seen the sequence repeat. The teleportation circles of Sigil, which as far as I can tell are new to 5th edition, are specific spots in the city that allow those with permission to enter the city through the use of a plane shift spell, but you cannot use them to leave. Sigil is a city of fog, gloom, rain, smog, and foul air. The rain is usually a drizzle rather than a downpour, and the smog is worst in the lower ward because that's Sigil's primary industrial area. But the fog and generally gloomy weather is fairly common. Sigil's temperature doesn't approach extremes, but it tends to be on the chiller side, except for the lower ward where the smoke keeps it warmer. Since Sigil floats along the top of an infinitely tall spire, the air up there is quite thin. If you've got a low constitution, it takes a few weeks to acclimate. There are no celestial bodies in Sigil's sky. No sun, no moon, no stars. Just 
empty. If you look over the edge of Sigil's band-like opening, aside from the torus around you, there's simply nothing to see. And if you jump out, you get flung to a random place in the universe, most likely never to be heard from again. Despite Sigil's sky having no real features, there is still a day-night cycle. Over the course of a 24-hour day, the sky fills with luminescence and fades back again to darkness. The brightest time of day is called peak, and the darkest time is called anti-peak, which roughly corresponds to noon and midnight. Since Sigil is on the inside of a giant torus, if you look up, at least on a clear day, you'll see the city stretching upward and overhead and all around you, buildings hanging down from the sky. The lights of the buildings on the opposite side of the torus interior twinkle above, though smoke and fog often obscure the view. In 2nd edition, Sigil has a distinct architectural style of bladed and spiked buildings, potentially to mirror the Lady of Pain's bladed mask or headdress, although while it looks like a mask or headdress, it's actually her face. It's a place of browns, grays, and muted reds, and at least in 5th edition, also the bluish-greenish color of verdigris. Buildings are most commonly made of iron and stone, magically conjured or imported from the other outer planes. But in 3rd through 5th edition, Sigil is home to a vast array of architectural styles, though 5th edition at least still makes sure to keep the blades. The 5th edition art of Sigil is much more colorful than the art provided by 2nd edition or Planescape Torment. I suppose it would make sense that Sigil would be a mishmash of styles considering it attracts such a variety of creatures, but I can't help but prefer the style that 2nd edition offers because it's more distinct. And on the other hand, since the Lady of Pain maintains such control over the city's portals and magical means of travel, it could make sense that she also maintains a general style of architecture to define the city, or at the very least the citizens of Sigil keep to a particular style in an effort to appease her. Well, whatever edition style you prefer, one constant is that Sigil is plagued by a razor vine, with it growing on many of the buildings. Razor vine is a sharp and dangerous dark vine capable of growing several feet a day. The black, heart-shaped leaves are harmless, but the stem hidden beneath the leaves is exceptionally sharp. It's a nuisance to many, though plenty of people appreciate its ability to keep out unwanted intruders, and even grow it intentionally on their homes or business places for that purpose. As I mentioned, the City of Doors is not a constant size. The Lady of Pain can shrink or enlarge the city as she sees fit. New buildings, streets, and courtyards are constantly being created by the Dabas, the caretakers of the city though they are also constantly tearing down or rebuilding other parts of the city. It makes you wonder what happens to the people living in those places when the Dabas suddenly come to tear down their homes, or when the Lady of Pain suddenly changes the city's dimensions. Who could say? Perhaps they get forcefully relocated in the first case, and in the second case, maybe in keeping with the paradoxical nature of Planescape, perhaps the new streets are somehow still there even when the city becomes smaller. But in any case, 2nd edition puts the population of Sigil at over a million, though two-thirds of them are just visitors. Honestly, that seems way too low to me. 4th edition provides measurements of a 6.4 mile diameter, which I'm assuming is the circular diameter rather than the toroidal major diameter, and a 1.5 mile thickness, which I'm assuming means the diameter of the torus tube rather than the toroidal minor diameter, or the thickness of this part right here. That gives a torus with a surface area of about 72 square miles, though that's the outer surface area of the torus. The inner surface area would be smaller depending on how thick the tube is between the outside and the hollow inside. It would also be smaller because there's a section of the inner band that is empty space. So to compensate for those things, let's say 60 square miles. A population of 1 million in a 60 square mile space roughly matches the population density of Tokyo which is the 88th most densely populated city on Earth, according to Wikipedia. Though that's a permanent population, not including visitors, but Sigil is described as always seeming crowded. Tiny spaces that might be pantries in another city are shops or homes in Sigil. Even the buildings crowd on top of each other, with some streets cut off from the sky. So, I'm thinking the population density should be more along the lines of Manila, which would put it at a population of 6.5 million permanent residents. But this is real-world cities we're comparing it to. There are other factors at play that I feel should raise the population even higher. For one thing, this is basically the hub of the entire universe. People come here from literally everywhere. You'd think a place like that would have a population at least in the billions, maybe even the trillions or quadrillions, depending on, you know, how many people exist in the universe. 
though I could see the Lady of Pain monitoring the population, not allowing it to exceed a certain threshold. So if you try to enter a portal to Sigil when it's full, you get hit with a queue timer like when the servers are too full in an online game. And the other big factor is portals. This isn't canon, which honestly might be a missed opportunity, but you'd have to imagine that the city known for its innumerable portals could have portals to a near-infinite supply of domiciles. A tiny building could house thousands of people. The front door is a portal, and each resident has their own portal key, which causes the portal to open to a demiplane apartment all their own. And with the ever-shifting nature of the city, Sigil could even operate like how an MMO such as World of Warcraft uses sharding. When a street is too populated, it could split into two versions of that street to hold all the people. So, for example, if you're chasing someone in the city, they may phase in and out of existence from your perspective as they get sent to different shards and re-emerge in your shard, enhancing the reality-defying nature of the Planescape setting. Basically, you've got to imagine that magic would make it possible to have population densities far exceeding real-world numbers. But whether you like those ideas or not, the point is that I think even a permanent population of 1 million is far too small for Sigil, let alone only one-third that many being permanent citizens. And to make matters even more ridiculous, 3rd edition puts the population at 250,000, with 4th edition specifying that only 50,000 of those are permanent residents. To put that in perspective, the population of the Waterdeep metropolitan area is 130,000, how does Sigil, the crossroads of the multiverse, which has a much larger area, have a permanent population less than half that of Waterdeep? But whatever the actual population is, it's supposed to be both very large and very crowded. Plus, it's confusing. Not only is the geography confusing, as roads curve in multiple directions because you're inside of a hollow torus, but the streets are ever-shifting with the Dabas changing them all the time, and the city expanding or shrinking at the Lady of Pain's whim. And there's so many freaking portals, which sure, there's a shortcut to where you want to go, but you probably don't know about it. So to get around Sigil, unless you're a longtime cager, which is what the permanent citizens call themselves, you've probably got to hire yourself a guide. Sigil's most prominent version of a taxi service are sedan chairs, carried by four strong creatures, such as fiends or bariar. Horse-drawn carriages are less commonly used because the streets are often narrow, the city's harsh cobblestones are bad for their hooves, and the grimy, smoggy air of the city kills them young. Why don't they have magically floating sedan chairs? Who knows? Sedan chairs are an easy and relatively inexpensive way to travel, though most chair carriers won't go into the more dangerous sections of the lower ward, and they won't enter the hive ward at all, which is the most dangerous and chaotic of the city's wards. Plus, they just take you where you want to go. They don't tell you where you should go or expose you to new and interesting parts of the city. For that, you want a tout. Touts are usually basically like street urchins who know the ins and outs of Sigil better than most. They know the best places to go, the best ways to get there, and the right amount to bribe the Harmonium patrols. There are also factotums, who are like touts, but they double as spies and converters for their particular faction. They'll show you around the city, all the while trying to convince you the truth of their faction's philosophy. But unlike touts, you don't pay factotums. They're assigned to visitors that the factol, the faction's leader, chooses. Then there are light boys. Since half the day is pretty dark, and since the weather is so often gloomy, Sigil can be a pretty poorly lit place. There are ancient street lights, but the Dabas no longer maintain them. Basically, light boys are children that wield lantern staves and hang around outside inns and in city squares offering their services, which is to follow you around with a light so you can see where you're going, and to rob you if you're not very careful. Sigil's also full of couriers, as sending a message across town is no simple task. Most couriers are human, but the Hall of Information also uses astral streakers, intelligent avians native to the astral plane. Her serenity, the Lady of Pain, is the ruler, protector, and symbol of Sigil. In fact, she's the symbol of the entire Planescape campaign setting. She's a mysterious, eternal, godlike being. A female-looking figure shrouded in robes with an elaborately bladed, mask-like face. She controls the portals of Sigil and is the only one who can create new ones within the city. She holds the power to lock the cage in times of turmoil to force the citizens to resolve their disputes, closing every single portal in the city. Food and supplies can't enter the city, the sewage can't leave, and so there's a limited time before everybody dies, unless they appease the Lady of Pain, prompting her to reopen the portals. The Lady of Pain uses her power to keep Sigil a neutral place in the multiverse, 
No gods or godlike beings, such as abyssal lords, are allowed to enter, though their servants can still enter, and the city contains temples to just about every god you could think of. Despite being a creature of at least god-tier power, and perhaps far exceeding the power of gods, the Lady of Pain does not allow anyone to worship her. Those who try know the Lady's wrath. The Lady of Pain can flay people with a mere look. In fact, she doesn't even need to look at you. Her shadow can flay people too, though I'm unsure if it does so as an automatic thing, as I've seen several people online suggest. Just like her looks, her shadow may only kill the people she wants it to kill. So perhaps you could safely step into her shadow if she's got no reason to kill you. Even still, most cagers avoid her shadow, either because they don't want to take the chance, or because they believe stepping into her shadow always means death. Honestly though, the Lady of Pain is a figure of such power that I bet she could flay you without being anywhere near you. And you might be flensed within an inch of your life, or you might be killed. But flaying is just one method she uses to punish those who interfere with her. The punishment she's best known for are the mazes. These are demiplanes in the deep ethereal plane that are essentially copies of streets and alleyways of Sigil that twist endlessly, doubling back on themselves forever. So if you're sentenced to a maze, you won't even realize it until it's too late. You'll just be walking through the streets when you slowly start to realize there's nobody around and you can't escape. Those trapped in the mazes don't age or die. They're just trapped there forever. Though every maze contains a secret exit portal somewhere, so there is hope of escaping. It's just that most people sent to the mazes never do. Mazes are usually reserved for those who threaten Sigil on a large scale or target the Lady of Pain herself. They say that the Lady of Pain's use of mazing is a relatively recent development, and that thousands of years ago she used to send people to the Throne of Blades in Agatheon, the third layer of Pandemonium. While she's been known to flay or maze people, the Lady of Pain also lets others, such as the Dabas or the Harmonium, the faction of Sigil responsible for law enforcement, punish those who defy her will. So if you pray to the Lady of Pain, you might get all your skin flayed off, or you might get thrown into the prison. The Lady of Pain doesn't live anywhere within Sigil, at least not anywhere that anybody knows of. She has no house or palace, perhaps she resides in her own demiplane, but she can sometimes be found floating through the streets, spreading an aura of awe and fear. People usually disperse when they see her to avoid the possibility of getting flayed or mazed, and in fact, many who see her go mad, winding up in the hive with the rest of the crazies. She never speaks, except for one time in the Die Vecna Die module, where she uses the language primeval to reorder the universe. So instead of speaking, she exudes her will over the city through some sort of telepathic connection to the Dabas, her faithful servants. Art depicting her usually makes her look quite large, and I found at least one site claiming she's 15 feet tall, but wasn't able to find any source to back that up. While the Lady of Pain is the ruler of Sigil, she's actually rather aloof and uncaring. She just seems to care about the stability and neutrality of Sigil. So, if you formulated her laws, they would be 1. Gods and godlike beings are not allowed in the city. 2. Do not worship the Lady of Pain. 3. Do not tamper with portals. 4. Do not threaten the safety or stability of the city. 5. Do not interfere with the Dabas. 6. Do not question the Lady of Pain. All other things, she doesn't really care. Things like murder and theft, not the Lady's concern. She leaves stuff like that up to the citizens and their various factions to handle. The Lady of Pain does sometimes intervene, though. For example, hundreds of years ago, there were 49 factions that threatened to throw the city into absolute chaos, and so in an event known as the Great Upheaval, the Lady of Pain mandated that there be a maximum of 15 factions. She's also been known to extinguish entire factions in one fell swoop, such as the communals who thought that all power should be shared, including the Lady's power, and the expansionists who tried to seize control of Sigil. Both groups were imprisoned in the mazes. And then there's also the Incantirium, a faction that believed the secret to everything was wizardly magic, headquartered in the Tower Sorceress in Sigil. But the faction became too powerful, and the Lady of Pain sent them and their entire tower into the mazes. Or at least that's most likely what happened. The few remaining members scattered to the Outer Plains as a sect rather than a faction. Sects are groups that don't have political power in Sigil. I covered them in this video. In 5th edition, the Tower Sorceress and the Incantirium have recently reappeared. 
Another example of the Lady of Pain intervening is when she killed Eoskar, god of portals, who desired Sigil and whose worship was rising in the city, to the point that even Dabas were worshipping him, and one even became his priest. She killed the god and destroyed his temple, now known as the Shattered Temple, where the Athar keep their headquarters. Some say that the reason the Lady of Pain doesn't let any gods within the city or allow anyone to worship her is that Eoskar will only stay dead so long as there is no god within Sigil. The Lady of Pain is not a human, and she isn't truly even a female. Nobody knows what she is, though there are plenty of in-world theories. Most think she's a god, perhaps an over-god. Some think she's a Dabas, perhaps their queen or their god. Though while the Dabas are her servants, they don't appear to literally worship her. Some say she's a reformed abyssal lord or ex-lord of the Nine. Some say she was once the Archlectress of Plagmort. Some say she was the first human mage to learn the secrets of Sigil, and thus has control over it. Others say she's actually six giant squirrels in a robe. The adventure module Die Vecna Die suggests that she's one of the Ancient Brethren, a group of beings that predate the universe, which roughly fits my own headcanon for her, which is that she's the embodiment of true neutrality, a constant throughout every past universe. Whatever her true nature, she's been the ruler of Sigil for as long as it's existed, which is a very, very long time. The Fraternity of Order think she created the city, and the Transcendent Order think that it's all her dream. Sigil is populated by basically every race you can imagine. Planers, beings native to the Outer Plains, such as Fiends, Celestials, Slotty, and Modrons, can all be found in large numbers in Sigil, though most of them aren't permanent residents, as they prefer their home planes. The bulk of the permanent planar population are humans, Githzerai, Bariar, and Tieflings. Other races like elves, dwarves, gnomes, and halflings can be found, but since they're generally not native to the plains, instead being primes, immigrants from the prime material plane, they're generally few and far between. A lot of the primes that live in Sigil are actually stuck here. They're called the Keyless, or the Marooned. They wound up here somehow and can't find the right portal or portal key to leave. Humans, of course, can also be primes, but humans hold a unique position in that there's also a sizable population of humans that are born and raised in the Outer Plains, rather than in the Prime Material Plane. In fact, 5th edition says that humans are the earliest known inhabitants of Sigil, except for, of course, the Lady of Pain and the Dabas. And some sages think that this is actually where they originated. Likewise, common, the language spoken on all sorts of prime material worlds, is believed to have originated in Sigil too, and perhaps explains why it's so widespread throughout the universe. Though even though the people here speak common, newcomers to Sigil may still have a difficult time understanding the citizens because of the slang used here, at least used by the cagers, known as the cant. For instance, bone box means mouth, burk means fool, the chant is gossip, news, or information, jink means money, the clueless are people who just don't get it, usually people from the prime material plane, and so on. But the true earliest inhabitants of Sigil are the Dabas, the caretakers of the city, the stewards of the Lady of Pain. By the way, I'm getting my pronunciation from this rebus, which shows a dot minus a t plus three z's, which I guess is supposed to be buzz, so da buzz. And there's also this rebus that shows it's definitely not pronounced dabu. And these rebuses are how the Dabas communicate. They can't talk, or at least they choose not to, and instead they create images in the air, rebuses, which are visual puzzles where words are represented by combinations of pictures and letters. Deciphering what a Dabas is saying can be difficult, especially if they're saying it quickly. They're known to live within structures far beneath the city, though of course still within the Taurus. The Dabas move through the streets, levitating above the ground, not quite flying and not quite walking. Their primary role is to maintain the city infrastructure, like cells repairing a body, but they also enforce the Lady of Pain's will. 5th edition has it that Dabas possess an innate aura that repairs their surroundings instead of them having to manually do it. Dabas are tall, slender, gray-skinned, robed beings with horns and white flame-like hair. There is only one sex of Dabas, and there are no Dabas children. No one is quite sure how new Dabas are created, though the most popular theory is that the illusory word pictures they create can merge with each other, taking on real form, and a new, full-formed, adult Dabas appears. 
The Planescape Monstrous Compendium No. 3 offers the idea that Dabas were originally created from the Lady of Pain taking some Furblas and modifying them, as Furblas are quite similar to Dabas. They're also tall, gaunt, have wispy white hair, and float a few inches above the ground. They also communicate with visual illusions, but rather than using rebuses, they form a written script around their heads. They come from a demiplane in the ethereal plane, an endless city of tall towers called Inferblau. But despite these similarities, the connection between the Furblas and the Dabas is just an in-world theory. Another creature common in Sigil are cranium rats. Unlike Dabas, which are only found in Sigil, cranium rats can also be found in other places in the outer planes, mostly the lower planes. Cranium rats look mostly like normal rats, except they have exposed brains that pulsate with sickly light. They are telepathic creatures that form a hive mind with other nearby cranium rats. Specifically, each cranium rat shares thoughts and brain capacity with each other cranium rat within 10 feet. You would imagine that this would chain, so that if there's one rat every 10 feet for a mile, then there's 528 rats all connected, sharing thoughts. Because if the first rat shares its thoughts with the second rat, and vice versa, then wouldn't the third rat also have the first rat's thoughts, because they're in the second rat's brain? As much as I think this would make sense, I'm not sure that it does work this way, as the Planescape Monster Supplement makes swarms of 100 rats out to be a very rare thing. But whether it chains endlessly or not, every 5 rats in telepathic contact increases the intelligence of the swarm by 1, such that a swarm of 100 rats has an intelligence of 20. And there is no upper bound to this, so a large enough swarm can achieve godlike intelligence. Really, the swarm doesn't even need to be that large. Just 200 rats have an intelligence of 40. Though if they really do all have to be within the same 10 feet square, then I suppose that would be difficult to fit 200 rats. But I think with an intelligence of 40, they'd figure it out. In 2nd edition, cranium rats are servants and spies of Ilsensine, the great godbrain of the Illithids, or Mind Flayers. In 5th edition, cranium rats no longer have any connection to the Mind Flayers that created them, and actually cooperate with the residents of Sigil, rather than spying and preying upon them. But in 2nd edition, cranium rats bring a 3 gold bounty from the Office of Vermin Control. Other creatures of Sigil include gray-green pigeons, executioner's ravens, and Aoskian hounds, all native to Sigil. The pigeons are pretty unremarkable, and I suppose Sigil's geography is just too disorienting or they're too vulnerable for them to be used as couriers. The executioner's ravens are enormous, and the biggest ones can speak. They're named executioner's ravens because they frequent the blocks, gallows, and stakes where food in the form of fresh corpses is common as executions are not an uncommon occurrence in the city, because the Mercy Killers, the faction responsible for carrying out punishments to lawbreakers, are quite bloodthirsty. The three most common methods of execution in Sigil are death by the noose, the sword, and the worm. The noose is most often used. The sword is reserved for nobles and other high-up figures where they get executed in Petitioner's Square, and the worm is an extremely rare method, and when it's used, the city declares a public holiday. The worm is a great green wyvern bred by the Mercy Killers for maximum ferocity and potent venom. They keep it in a tower by the prison until it's needed. And then there's the Aoskian hounds. They're two-headed hounds used as watchdogs in the more private spaces of the city, though they can also be found wandering the city at night. They were first bred by the followers of the god of portals, Aoskar, thus their name. Mostly they're known for their thunderous bark, which has the power to stun but I like to imagine that they also have the ability to teleport around like blink dogs, as I just think that would be fitting. The last creature I'll mention is the Razorvine Blight. Normally, Razorvine is just a plant commonly found in Sigil and some of the lower plains, one that's dangerous and grows rapidly, yes, but just a plant. But 5th edition specifies that when Razorvine absorbs vampiric blood, it awakens into a sentient, vaguely humanoid being called a Razorvine Blight. They typically appear as ordinary Razorvine, waiting for the right moment until they ambush unsuspecting passersby. There are a few notable characters living in Sigil. Actually, there's a lot. This book offers details on 55 of them, all connected to each other in some way or another. But I'll just cover a few that I think are the most important or interesting. First, there's Shemeshka the Marauder, known as the King of the Cross Trade. She's an Arcanoloth spymaster who pulls many of the strings in Sigil. Arcanoloths normally have jackal heads, but Shemeska's head is that of a fox. 
She's always impeccably dressed and groomed, and likes to wear a razor vine headdress, perhaps in an attempt to resemble the Lady of Pain. With her network of spies, she has the power to destroy the factions overnight, but she prefers to keep them intact to serve her own ends. You might think the factions would want to kill her then, but they need her as much as they hate her. She features prominently in the 5th edition Turn of Fortune's Wheel adventure. Pharaoh is a Shadow Elf spy, an expert at taking on new personas. He accidentally wound up in Sigil and joined the Revolutionary League, and then met Shemeshka and started spying for her. He infiltrated every single one of the factions using a different persona. For example, to the Sensates, he's a female tiefling mage named Ava Dowling, and to the Harmonium, he's a male human paladin named Josbert Plum. The strain of switching between 15 different personas took a toll on his mind. You see, Pharaoh's basically a method actor. To play a convincing role, he first convinces himself of the role. So now he's got an intense case of split personality disorder. Each persona doesn't know of the other's existence. Judge Gabberslug presides over the Court of Woe, a dustman tribunal in the lower ward that the Fraternity of Order sometimes send the accused to when the city courts are overcrowded. The building is actually empty. It's only when dustmen or those with official business enter the doorway that they're transported to the real Court of Woe, a fortress in the negative energy plane. Gabberslug is a Nalfeshni, who used to be a judge on the Mountain of Woe in the Abyss, where mortals are judged, though he was banished for being something of a prankster. Usually the punishments assigned here are tamer than you'd get from the Mercy Killers, though every once in a while Gabberslug consumes the life force of the accused. The Grixit is a female human petitioner who prowls the streets of Sigil by night, looking for portals to permanently close. Her eyes have the special power of being able to see the locations of portals. She was a member of the now-extinct Expansionist faction. Her mission of closing as many of Sigil's portals as possible is her way of getting back at the Lady of Pain for destroying the faction to which she once belonged. She's so absorbed by her mission that she's forgotten her real name. And of course, being a petitioner doesn't help with that. In 5th edition, she's a captive in the prison. Rule of Three is a Cambion who usually disguises himself as a Githzerai and hangs out in the Styx Oarsman, a tavern in the lower ward. He's a font of information, especially information relating to the Abyss, though only ask him questions if you've got a lot of time on your hands, because he always gives three answers. In fact, he always speaks in threes. You've also got to give him a set of three different payments for the info, but he doesn't care what he's paid, as long as it comes in threes, and as long as it's a related set, like a glove, a shoe, and a hat, a gold coin, a silver coin, and a copper coin, or a joke, a proverb, and an insult. He also grows and sells viper trees. Elem is a Modron, a monodrone to be specific, that got injected with red slod eggs during a great Modron march. Usually, when you get pumped up with slod eggs, they gestate inside you and then chew their way out, killing you in the process. But somehow for Elem, the slod merged with the monodrone's flesh and metal innards, and the chaotic influence caused the Modron to go rogue. He changed his name to Elem and morphed into the shape of a quadrone. Elem found its way into Sigil, and, still looking for some semblance of order but with an addled brain, mistook random events for rules and customs. For example, now it smacks people over the head as a form of greeting, because it once saw the harmonium do it. Elem also tries to use the cant of Sigil, but while it knows the words, it doesn't know the meaning, so what it says is half nonsense. Now he lives in an abandoned, crumbled tower in the Slags, which is basically the worst part of the entire city, and he fancies himself a wizard. He's stricken with a desire to create, but his half slod nature has rendered him unable to duplicate like monodrones normally can, so he hires out adventurers to cast spells in specific places in the Outer Plains, hoping to create spell haunts, which are semi-intelligent apparitional remnants of spells created by casting magic somewhere it shouldn't have been cast. Patch is a razor vine blight. In 5th edition, Patch spreads copies of itself across the city to create a spy network. In 2nd edition, Patch isn't a humanoid shape, but rather a tangle of razor vine growing on Elem's tower. Rule of Three periodically stops by the tower at night with a new razor vine cutting to add, and to kill people in the razor vine, feeding their blood to Patch, and in return, Patch answers three questions. The story goes that razor vine originally comes from a mysterious layer of the abyss where Tanari feed an entire mountain of it lots and lots of blood, which allows them to see through razor vine anywhere that it grows. So all the people intentionally growing razor vine on their houses to keep robbers away are actually giving up their secrets to the abyss. 
And if that's true, it makes sense why the Lady of Pain seems to hate the Razor Vine, having the Dabas cut back the stuff as often as they can. Mort is a wise-cracking and talkative floating skull. He's a self-professed, famous planes traveler that often poses as a mimir, which are floating objects that act as planar encyclopedias, providing their owners with information and storing data. Though where mimirs are magic items, Mort is just a living skull. He's a petitioner that was doomed to the Pillar of Skulls in Avernus for betraying the Nameless One, the player character of Planescape Torment. But he was later pulled out of the Pillar and amended his betrayal, and now he resides in Sigil. There's also Cerilli, a female Eladrin seeking to start a new faction called the Planarists that would expel and keep out Primes from the City of Doors. There's a particularly well-known and well-connected tiefling tout named Kylie, who prefers to be paid in magical items. An arms dealer Asura named Ko, who supplies both the Tanari and the Beatezi with weapons in the hopes that they'll kill each other with them and keep the blood war contained to the lower planes. And there's a chaos detect lawyer named Sly Nye who charges random rates and relies entirely on creativity to win his arguments. He often hangs out in the Dusty Wig Tavern across the street from the city courts and claims that he's never lost a case. An elderly tiefling woman named Aluvius Ruskin manages a shop called Tivum's Antiquities in the Market Ward, the largest supplier of gate keys in the cage. She's an Encantifier, the faction known for sucking the power out of magic items and spells, and one of the very few remaining in 2nd edition, with the ultimate goal of draining Sigil itself of magic. Unity of Rings is a Movanic diva, or perhaps you'd like to pronounce that deva, I know I would, but apparently that's not how it's pronounced who flies around Sigil doing charitable acts and freely giving his belongings and his advice to any in need. Word is he was the inspiration for the sect known as the Ring Givers, and some even say he founded the sect, but turned down the role of leadership. There are many other characters to be found in Sigil, but I won't talk about all of them, though there are still a few I'll mention in later sections of the video. The City of Doors is home to 15 different factions. At least it is in 2nd edition before the events of the Faction War Adventure module that ends with the factions having to leave Sigil or disband. Though, to be honest, that adventure module was largely ignored going forward in the greater D&D lore, as the factions are all mostly intact in later editions. Each faction vies for power in Sigil, and hopes to win the hearts and minds of its people, to convince everyone of the truth of their view of the multiverse. This struggle is known as the Krieg Stands. The high-up members of each faction have a say in the city's legislation in the Hall of Speakers, and this is truly what makes a faction a faction, having political power, or a say in the lawmaking. The factions each have a headquarters within Sigil, but also a plane where they keep a base of operations outside the city. Most of them also perform some function for the city. Some of these are official roles, and some not. Within each faction, there's a hierarchy, with namers being the lowest rank, these are the people who have merely signed up, but don't necessarily have any responsibility. Factotums are the next highest rank. They are full-timers. The most visible ones act as guides and messengers within the city, but many of them serve as soldiers, scholars, diplomats, enforcers, and spies. Factor is the next rank. These are the high-up figures, overseeing operations. In the top rank, the leader of the faction, is the Factol, though factions often have their own specific names for some of these ranks. I've already made a video explaining the factions of Sigil, but they're an important part of the city, perhaps the most important part, so here I'll just explain each one briefly. But that video I made was before Planescape was revived for 5th edition, so I'll also mention some changes made in 5e. The 15 factions are the Athar, who claim the gods are frauds, the Believers of the Source, who test themselves for godhood, the Bleak Cabal, who find no sense in the multiverse, the Doomguard, who celebrate destruction and decay, the Dustmen who believe we're already dead, the Fated who take all they can and more, the Fraternity of Order who discover laws to get at the truth, the Free League who prize the individual above all, the Harmonium who enforce peace through might, the Mercy Killers who bring justice to the deserving, the Revolutionary League who topple the structures of power, the Sign of One who place each being at the center of all, the Society of Sensation who find truth only in experience, the Transcendent Order, who act before they think, if they think at all, and the Chaosatex, who spread beauty through chaos. The Athar, also called the Defiers or the Lost, believe that the gods are merely very powerful beings, not worthy of truly being considered gods at all, and that the unknowable truth lies beyond the veil. Their headquarters in Sigil is the Shattered Temple in the Lower Ward, 
once the great temple of doors dedicated to Eoscar that the Lady of Pain destroyed, or mostly destroyed, rather. They form a spy network to monitor and undermine the religious institutions of the city and beyond. They keep a base in the astral plane, and their factal is a human priest named Terence. The believers of the Source, also called the Godsmen, believe that all life springs from the same divine Source, ascending and descending in form as the cosmos tests it. Their headquarters in the city is the Great Foundry in the Lower Ward, where they craft all sorts of tools and items. They keep a base in the ethereal plane, and their factal is a half-elf ranger named Ambar Vergrove. The Bleak Cabal, also called Bleakers, the Cabal, and Mad Men, believe that the multiverse doesn't make any sense, and that it's not supposed to. There's no grand scheme, no deep meaning, no elusive order. The only truth worth finding lies within. Their headquarters is the Gatehouse in the Hive Ward. The Gatehouse is an insane asylum, so the Bleakers are caretakers of the insane, but they also run soup kitchens and healing houses throughout the city. They keep a base in Pandemonium, and their factal is a half-orc fighter named Lar. The Doomguard, also called the Sinkers, believe that entropy is ecstasy, that decay is divine. The multiverse is supposed to fall apart, and they're just here to keep people from interfering. Their headquarters is the Armory in the Ladies' Ward, where they craft weapons and armor. They keep a base on each of the negative quasi-elemental planes, and their factal is a human ranger named Pentar. The Dustmen, also called the Dead or Dusters, believe that we're all dead, some more so than others. They seek to explore their current state with patience, purge themselves of passion, and ascend toward the purity of true death. Their headquarters is the Mortuary in the Hive Ward, where they inter the dead and perform funeral rites. They keep a base in the plane of negative energy, and their factal is a lich, once a human wizard, named Skull, though the fact that he's a lich is a secret. The Fated, also called the Takers or the Heartless, believe that the multiverse belongs to those who seize it. No one's to blame for a poor sod's fate but himself. Their headquarters is the Hall of Records in the Clerk's Ward, where they control the administration of deeds, registrations, certificates, and business transactions, and they serve as the city tax collectors. They keep a base in Isgard, and their factal is a human ranger and priest named Duke Rowan Darkwood. The Fraternity of Order, also called the Governors, believe that everything has laws, though most are dark, which means secret. Learn the laws of the multiverse, and you can rule it. Their headquarters is the city court in the Ladies' Ward, where they serve as judges and lawyers. They keep their base in Mechanus, and their factal is a dwarf sage named Hashkar, who actually turns out to be a petitioner bound to Sigil. Petitioners visiting Sigil are rare enough, but a petitioner being bound to Sigil is just something that doesn't happen, except it did for Hashkar. So the few people that know this secret suspect that he was crazy enough to worship the Lady of Pain in life, and so was bound to Sigil in death and for whatever reason, she allows him to remain. The Free League, also called the Indeps, believe that they aren't a faction and nobody tells them what to do. Keep your options open because nobody's got the key to truth. Their headquarters is the Great Bazaar in the Market Ward, where some act as merchants, but many act as mercenaries for the other factions, or spies, couriers, and guards. They keep a base in the Outlands, and they don't have a factal. The Harmonium, also called the Hardheads, believe that peace is their goal, but if it takes a little war to get others to set things right, the Harmonium way, so be it. That's how they'll reach their golden harmony. Their headquarters is the city barracks, where they act as the city's police force. They keep a base in Arcadia, and their factal is a human paladin named Saren. The Mercy Killers, also called the Red Death or the Jailers, believe that justice is everything. When properly applied, punishment leads to perfection. Their headquarters is the prison, where they act as jailers and executioners, but they also sometimes act as bounty hunters and guards. They keep a base in Acheron, and their factal is a tiefling wizard named Allison Nalesia. The Revolutionary League, also called the Anarchists, believe that the status quo is built on lies and greed. They want to crush the factions, break them all down, and rebuild with what's left. That's the only way to find the real truth. They don't have a headquarters in the city, but rather stay mobile. They act as spies and saboteurs throughout the city. They keep a base in Carcery, and they don't have a factal. The Sign of One, also called the Signers, believe that the multiverse exists because the mind imagines it. The Signers, it could be any Signer, or all of them, create the multiverse through the power of thought. Their headquarters in Sigil is the Hall of Speakers in the Clerk's Ward, where they act as legislators and mediators in debates. 
though all factions have a vote in new legislature. They keep a base in the Beastlands, and their factal is a human diviner named Darius. The Society of Sensation, also called the Sensates, believe that to know the multiverse, you must experience it fully. The senses form the path to truth, for the multiverse doesn't exist beyond what can be sensed. Their headquarters is the Civic Fest Hall in the Clerk's Ward, where they act as entertainers and collectors of sensations and memories. They keep a base in Arborea, and their factol is a human priestess named Erin Montgomery. The Transcendent Order, also called the Cyphers, believe that action without thought is the purest response. Train body and mind to act in harmony, and the spirit will become one with the multiverse. Their headquarters in the city is the Great Gymnasium in the Guildhall Ward, where they serve as trainers and advisors and act as a balancing force in the city. They keep a base in Elysium, and their factol is a tiefling fighter and mage named Reese. The Chaosatex, also called the Chaos Men, believe that chaos is truth, order is delusion. By embracing the randomness of the universe, one learns its secrets. They don't really have an official headquarters, or an unofficial headquarters, but their official, unofficial, unofficial headquarters is the Hive in the Hive Ward, which is basically just a shanty town. They have no real role within the city, they just represent the dispossessed and disenfranchised, and they keep things fresh. They have a base in Limbo, and their factol is a Githzerai fighter named Charon, though he quits two or three times a day. He's only factal when he wants to be. At the end of the Faction War Adventure module, nearly all the Factals have either been killed or mazed, and the Lady of Pain tells each of the factions that Sigil tolerates them no longer. Abandon it, or die. Most of the Athar leave Sigil and regroup at the base of the Spire in the Outlands, though some go underground into Under Sigil. The Believers of the Source plan on leaving Sigil to test themselves out in the vastness of the multiverse, but before they leave, the Sign of One approach them, and the two factions merge into a new faction, based in the Outlands, called the Mind's Eye, also called Seekers or Visionaries, which combine both of the faction's tenets. The Bleak Cabal disbands officially, but the members continue to live in Sigil and do their charitable works. The Doom Guard leaves Sigil and retreats to their fortresses on the negative quasi-elemental planes. The Dustmen dissolve their organization, but the members continue to run the mortuary. The Faded leave Sigil and head to their base in Isgard. Their philosophy shifts from taking whatever they can to living on whatever they can get, which is more in line with what it originally started as. The Fraternity of Order leaves Sigil for their base in Mechanus. The result of the Faction War is a dream for the Free League. They always wanted a Sigil without factions, and most of them always said that the Free League isn't a faction anyway. Well, now it officially isn't. The Harmonium leaves for their base in Arcadia and become a lot less militaristic. Back during the Great Upheaval, the two factions known as the Sod Killers and the Sons of Mercy joined to form the Mercy Killers, and now the Mercy Killers dissolve back along those original lines, with the Sons of Mercy being more about clean, honest justice, and the Sod Killers being about violence and punishment. Though of course, factions aren't allowed in Sigil, so the Sod Killers reform as the Minders Guild, technically not a faction as they have no legal power but they hire themselves out as mercenaries and bodyguards, and the Sons of Mercy officially disband but continue to oversee the prison. Like the Free League, the Revolutionary League get what they always wanted, the downfall of the factions. They disband and retreat to Carcery, half of them plotting to establish a new regime in Sigil, and the other half forming a new Revolutionary League to oppose the first half. Some members of the Society of Sensation disband and remain in Sigil, and the others retain their faction and leave for Arborea. The Transcendent Order relinquishes their faction status, but stays in Sigil to help clean up the chaotic aftermath of the faction war, founding the Sigil Advisory Council to guide the citizens in electing a new government. The Chaos Attacks carry on as if nothing happened, though without a faction label. They've disbanded and renamed themselves countless times anyway, so really this is nothing new to them. But as I said earlier, most of this isn't upheld going forward. In 5th edition, most of the factions are back in Sigil, and most of the factals are the same. But there are some differences. In 5th edition, there are 12 ascendant factions, the ones that actually have political power. The Athar, the Bleak Cabal, the Doomguard, the Faded, the Fraternity of Order, the Hands of Havoc, the Harmonium, the Heralds of Dust, a renamed Dustman, the Mercy Killers, the Mind's Eye, the Society of Sensation, and the Transcendent Order. The only factol that's different is that of the Mind's Eye, an elf wizard named Saladrin, 
where in 2nd edition it was a Vodkin, or wood giant, shaman named Ombedias. The only faction completely missing in 5e is the Chaosatex, and the only new faction is the Hands of Havoc, though they're basically just the Revolutionary League except with some arson thrown in. But then there are also six minor factions. The Free League and the Revolutionary League are still here, though have waned in numbers and influence. The Free League maintains the Great Bazaar as its headquarters, but the Revolutionary League has retreated into Undersigil. And then there's the Incantarium, also called the Incantifiers, who consume magic and its secrets. They're a group of wizards that I mentioned before who believe that magic is the key to everything, and they've made a comeback after having disappeared for hundreds of years. Their headquarters is the Tower Sorceress, and their factual is unknown, I guess because they're still new and mysterious. Another minor faction is the Ringgivers, also called the Bargainers, who give as much as they get. They're essentially the opposite of the Faded, giving away all they have. They have no headquarters in Sigil, and their factual is a human jester named Jermo the Natterer. They were just a sect in 2nd edition, but in 5th edition, the Ringgivers have risen to the status of faction. And then there's the Coterie of Cakes and the Undivided, both minor factions of Undersigil, headquartered in Nowhere. The Coterie of Cakes, also called the Cakers, believe that the multiverse is a great, multi-layered cake, and that baked goods are the fundamental unit of trade. The Undivided, also called the Deniers, believe that those who pass through portals are destroyed and replaced with clones. But now on to the Wards of Sigil. The Ladies' Ward is the most open, spacious, silent, and affluent of the wards, and nearly as orderly as the Clerk's Ward. The main streets here are cold, broad, and echoing, where the sky is more open than any part of the city. It's named for the Lady of Pain, but not because she lives here or anything, but because this is where her will is enforced, or at least where the people imagine her will is enforced. It's where the courts, the barracks, and the prison are. Though it wasn't always named that. It used to be called the Palace Ward, but was renamed to appease the Lady of Pain. The Lady's Ward is a place of riches, corruption, and political schemes. It's been compared to a chessboard, where no move goes unnoticed or unchallenged. It's located between the Market Ward and the Lower Ward. Each of the wards are also split into several districts. In the Lady's Ward, there are six. The Court District, surrounding the City Court. Firm Ground, surrounding the Barracks. The Armory District, also known as Entropy's Gem, surrounding, of course, the Armory, the Grey Towers District, surrounding the Prison, the Temple District, and the Noble District, where the nobles of Sigil, often called Golden Lords, live in well-guarded palaces called the High Houses. The Golden Lords, with their immeasurable wealth, act as the hidden government of the city, running things from behind the scenes. Their schemes aren't just bound to the city, though, as many of them have built empires of interplanar trading. Perhaps in an effort to balance out the corruption, the Ladies' Ward is home to more than half of the city's temples. The temples are sprawling, elaborate, richly decorated buildings, so perhaps the temples are no strangers to corruption either. The Armory is the home of the Doom Guard, where they make weapons and armor. It's a huge, dominating building, though that's fairly common for the buildings in the Ladies' Ward, and of the faction headquarters in general. Razorvine covers the lower walls, and there's only a single entrance, not counting the open roof where the heat escapes. The first of its 24 floors is dominated by a colossal forge called the Forge of Doom, and this is the only floor open to the public. Beyond the forge are four heavily guarded tower chambers containing the portals to the Doom Guard's fortresses on the negative quasi-elemental planes. The armory sits in the seediest part of the ward, on the edge between the Ladies' Ward and the Lower Ward and some argue that it's really part of the Lower Ward. The streets around the Armory are still quiet, but that stillness hides a lot of sinister activity. It's a popular spot for mercenaries, thieves, and assassins to meet their employers. The city barracks is at the opposite end of the ward from the Armory, and it's the home of the Harmonium. Because of the fear of the Harmonium, the streets nearby are serene, even empty. While the barracks is a massive, imposing building, Unlike the armory, it's rather plain and faceless, not ornamented in spikes and gargoyles, except for the giant pair of clasped stone hands over the arched entrance, which is honestly pretty cool. The barracks is a rectangular building with towers at each corner, and a massive parade ground in the center, where the harmonium displays its might through drills and marches, though really only in 5th edition, because in 2nd edition, the barracks are much more closed off, not just anyone can enter. The few businesses nearby the barracks enjoy extra protection, but at the cost of having to obey all the laws and regulations of the city to the letter. 
The city court, in 5th edition called the High Courts, sits in the heart of the ward. It's the home of the Fraternity of Order and is where legal matters are settled. The court, while imposing, is also dignified, hewn from flawless white marble with bladed gables and towers. Granite steps rise to the entrance, above which the governor's motto, knowledge is power, is etched into a triangular pediment. Unlike the barracks in the armory, the court really is a public space, though there still are private halls of the governors within that most have never seen, containing the collected secrets of the multiverse. The lesser courts are where mundane legal proceedings take place, while the more serious offenses are adjudicated in the Grand Court, featuring the most prestigious and powerful judges, such as Planetars, Pit Fiends, and even Factal Hashkar himself. Judges in the city court are usually members of the Fraternity of Order, though not always. For example, some judges are Modrons or even Dabas. The city court is also home to the Hall of Concordance, an embassy of law where contracts are forged beneath the watchful eyes of the Inevitables terrifying and nigh-unstoppable constructs created by the Primus, the godlike leader of the Modrons, to enforce the rule of law throughout the cosmos. A Kolyarut ratifies the contract, and Maruts ensure its enforcement, brutally and decisively. Perhaps those are pronounced Kolyarut and Marut? I don't really know. The area around the city court is the most lively place in the ladies' ward, with masses gathering to spectate on trials, and lawyers, or advocates, most often tieflings or devils, advertising their services. The prison is the home of the mercy killers, and also all of the lawbreakers of Sigil sentenced here. It's a mass of grim stone and spikes surrounded by broad avenues, where passers-by can hear faint wailing from within. In both 2nd and 5th edition, the prison is a tall building, though in 2nd edition it's shaped essentially like the barracks, with several watchtowers along the walls, and a large portion of it underground. In 5th edition, the prison is one giant, jagged tower. While the building itself is frightening, it does have the benefit of making crime virtually non-existent in the surrounding area, as there are all too many rumors of the mercy killers arresting, trying, and punishing wrongdoers themselves, and the sentence they'll give you is likely to be far harsher than what you get in the court. Not far from the prison is the Tower of the Worm, which the Mercy Killers use as a holding cell for less serious criminals. Of course, it's also where they keep their executioner wyvern. They regularly harvest the creature's venom to use in interrogations. It induces a state of delirium that makes it easier to extract confessions, so it kind of acts as a truth serum. Though, knowing the Mercy Killers, I wouldn't be surprised if it leads to false confessions just as often as truthful ones. The Ladies' Ward is also home to Fortune's Wheel which has earned special attention in 5th edition as it's an important place in the adventure named after it, the Turn of Fortune's Wheel. It's where the High and Mighty come to engage in the Kriegstans, blackmailing each other, making deals, and exchanging secrets for favors and power. It's named after a wheel on the wall that gamblers spin to win random prizes with terrible odds. In 2nd edition, Fortune's Wheel is primarily a tavern and secondarily a casino, while 5th edition's rendition of it really leaned into the casino side of things. Though in both cases, there's a common room called the Dragon Bar, where a carved dragon arches over the bar and regales people with stories. However, in 2nd edition, the Dragon Bar is huge and opulent, whereas in 5th edition, it's small and modest. Another difference between the editions is that in 2nd edition, this is Shemeshka the Marauder's favorite hangout spot, where she dines and effectively holds court, while in 5th edition, she actually owns the place. The Palace of the Jester, also called the Court of Pain, is a truly massive palace of echoing corridors and dead-end staircases that serves as a neutral gathering ground for the rich and powerful, though the halls remain relatively empty at most times, and only the Dabas really seem to be comfortable in this place. While not everyone knows it, or would admit it, the ruler of the palace is the Lady's Jester, Jeremo the Natterer. In 2nd edition, Jeremo is a member of the Ringgivers, hoping to become factual of the Ringgivers when they achieve faction status, which he does achieve in 5th edition but the Ringgivers sell the place and move to the streets of the Lower Ward. Jeremo controls many of the puppet strings of the city's bureaucracy and has an uncanny knack for predicting where portals will appear. He's in possession of a magic item called the Helm of the Dabas that allows its wearer to communicate as the Dabas do, allowing them to become a sort of honorary Dabas. Jeremo's is the only one known to exist. I said before that the Ladies' Ward is home to over half of the temples of Sigil, one of the biggest is the Temple of the Abyss, a temple to every one of the Abyssal Lords. It's a menacing place of black stone decorated with blades that reach high into the sky in the heart of the ward. 
Each night at Antipeak, the priests venerate one of the Abyssal Lords by impaling sacrifices on the blades of the temple exterior. The faces of the Lords of the Abyss are carved over the entrances, and the temple interior is a gloomy sanctuary of evil filled with marble columns, thousands of black burning candles, golems in the shape of semi-reptilian griffins that kill intruders, and a purple flame glowing in the heart of the sanctuary. In the temple's central tower are the bells of Baphomet, which ring every anti-peak, but only those who have struck bargains with the fiends of the temple can hear them tolling. Those who break their agreements hear the bells constantly wherever they go, eventually driving them mad until the demon of the bells shows up to kill them for oath-breaking. In 5th edition, this temple is called the Infinite Well because it floats above a seemingly bottomless pit. Other noteworthy locations in the Lady's Ward include Heart's Fire, the Temple of Hermes, the Twelve Factals, the Golden Bariar Inn, and Traben's Forge. Heart's Fire is a luminous temple of stained glass windows devoted to gods of fire, light, and truth. It's nicknamed the Son of Sigil because it glows each day at what would be dawn. The Temple of Hermes is noteworthy amongst the many temples of this ward because Hermes has a wide following in Sigil due to all the travelers. The Twelve Factals is an inn beneath the city streets. It contains a series of increasingly deeper dining halls that continue into the mysterious catacombs of Undersigil that many never return from. One of the dining halls features statues of the Twelve Factals to commemorate the spot that they met a thousand years ago to beg the Lady of Pain to put a stop to the Expansionists, the dominant faction at the time. The Golden Bariar Inn is a tavern serving clientele from the Upper Plains. It's located near the armory and an enormous statue of Bigby, and is popular with the richest and most refined of Sigil's citizens. Traben's Forge is a smithy run by Traben the Dwarf and his son, his great-grandson, and an adopted ogre named Cole Chewer. They're known for producing elaborately crafted and decadently expensive armor, popular among the Harmonium and the Paladins of Mount Celestia, such as the Order of the Plains Militant. The Clerk's Ward sits between the Market and Guildhall wards, which are commonly just seen as one ward, and the Hive Ward, and is drastically different from both. The Clerk's Ward is the most orderly and cleanly of the wards. Here, the laws are more rigidly enforced and the Harmonium patrols are more common than anywhere else in the city, except right outside the barracks in the Ladies' Ward. The Clerk's Ward is the home of Sigil's bureaucracy, thus its name, home to the Hall of Records, the Hall of Speakers, and the Hall of Information, though it is also a cultural hub, home to the Civic Fest Hall. The districts of the Clerk's Ward are the Administrator's District, where the ward's elite such as government officials live, the Workers' District, where the common folk live, the relatively isolated sandstone district that borders the Hive Ward, home primarily to tieflings, the Fest Hall district, which stands in colorful contrast to the rather drab surroundings of the rest of the ward, and a neighborhood called Little Arcadia, where many members of the Harmonia live that doesn't allow any tieflings or fiends to enter. The Hall of Records is thought of by many as the heart of the ward, and is the home of the Faded, where public documents are kept and where you go to apply for licenses and whatnot. It used to be Big B's College of Academic Arts, but a slightly overdue debt to the Faded closed the place down, and the Faded took over. The college was comprised of seven buildings, but when the Faded took over, they sold one to pay for the renovations to the other six. The whole campus is called the Hall of Records, but the main building, a monstrous tower 30 stories high, is also named that. The Hall of Records is full of record-keeping and administrative offices, and in theory you can come here to look up specific documents, but the process is such a bureaucratic nightmare that your chances of success are slim unless you offer a substantial bribe. There are underground vaults that the Faded use to store more sensitive information, such as the volumes of the Secret History of Sigil, which details the activities of the Faded and all they've learned over the years. The Hall of Information is a gleaming blue-domed building that acts as Sigil's welcome center and help office, such as providing general information or directions around Sigil. It's located on the same street of the Clerk's Ward as the Hall of Records and the Hall of Speakers, equally spaced between the two. The marble pillars outside the hall bear its motto, Cooperation, Compliance, Control. The interior is an apple-scented and spotless hall of polished blue marble with black marble desks. Though make sure to avoid touching anything or you'll be whipped by the chief, an especially angry barriar named Borden Mock. There are no chairs or benches within. The Hall of Information contains all of these departments. When you arrive, you have to look through the directory of offices, choose one to make an appointment with, pay a fee, 
show up on time to your appointment, and then find out if the department you chose was the right one for the information you seek or the problem you have. And if not, go back to step number one. The Hall of Speakers is the home of the Sign of One, and it's where public debates are held that plant the seeds of law. Where the city court is the main judicial building of Sigil, the Hall of Speakers is the main legislative building. In second edition, the Hall of Speakers is a long, oval-shaped dome topped by a spire, with a garden in the center. In fifth edition, it's a collection of rings and domed buildings. In both editions, a gargantuan statue of a woman holding up a world, called the Power of One, stands outside one of the entrances. The chamber where the important debates happen is called the Speaker's Podium, where only the Council of Speakers may participate, though anyone can spectate. The Council of Speakers is made up only of delegates of the city's factions, usually factors or factals, and the Speaker, whose role it is to oversee the debates, is always a signer. Ordinary citizens, or even visitors, who can't manage to get on the Speaker's list may instead go to the Trianum, a public forum where anyone can participate, located just a block away from the Hall of Speakers. The Civic Fest Hall is the home of the Society of Sensation, and where people from all over the city come for entertainment. It's a gigantic, colorful, majestic building of staggering grace and beauty, constructed from a wide range of materials from all over the plains, intended to delight and intrigue the senses. Street performers are frequently found outside, while the inside is a collection of theaters, galleries, lecture halls, and sensoriums. Wren Hall is the largest public theater where large-scale productions are held. Elloweth Theater is a smaller theater featuring more highbrow performances, North Umber Amphitheater is an outdoor theater where contests and duels are held. Sensoriums are libraries of memories and sensory experiences contained within sense stones. There is a public sensorium as well as one only open to sensates. The Society of Sensation pays highly for memories and sensations that aren't in their vast collection. The Tower Sorceress is the home of the Incantarium, recently returned to Sigil in 5th edition. It's a spiny spire of unknown material whose surface shifts like a puddle of oil. The building has no doors or windows at ground level, with only balconies rather high up, though incantifiers can walk right through the building to enter. One can assume that the interior houses all manner of powerful magical artifacts and secret magical knowledge, but no one really knows what the incantifiers get up to in there. In addition to a wide variety of taverns that I'll describe in a bit, there are a few more notable places in the clerk's ward. T Street Transit, situated between the Hall of Speakers and the Hall of Records, provides its customers with onion-shaped cabs pulled by Arcadian ponies, which have light green hides, long rabbit ears, and a tentacle growing from their chest which they use to carry torches. In 5th edition, you'll also find cabs pulled by displacer beasts, unicorns, and other fantastic creatures from the Outer Plains. A place called Gina Ely's compound is the home of Gina Ely and her scribes and bodyguards. She's a famous writer and adventurer. She's led a life as something of an investigative journalist and storyteller, traveling to dangerous places in the Outer Plains for material for her books. But she's getting on in age and nowadays prefers to send adventurers to the dangerous places to collect information in her stead, while she stays here, writing. Perhaps the most breathtaking monument in Sigil, and one of the most famous, is the Trioptic Nicopona, also called the Triona. It's a 200-foot-tall Nicopona with three eyes. Nicoponas are colorful and intelligent horses native to the Outlands with the ability to travel to the other plains at will. The base of the statue has three platforms that act as portals to the Primaterial Plain, Elysium, and Mount Celestia, though the statue is guarded day and night by members of the Doom Guard to prevent unauthorized access. Then there's Tensar's Unemployment Service, Sigil's most well-known and successful employment agency. The Laz School of Vivid Unpleasantness, a loud and festive art school that tends toward controversial expressionism, and Grundlethumb's Automatic Scribe, a small shop where you can pay an enchanted machine to create documents for you. Except, rather than binding an elemental into the machine like he intended, the owner, Grundlethumb Black Dagger, accidentally bound a mysterious abyssal entity inside who's been wreaking a bit of havoc. The Fest Hall District is where the best taverns are, as it's where the people of the Clerk's Ward care most about food and entertainment. The Green Gauge is a tavern just across the street from the Civic Fest Hall that specializes in cider and acts as something of a second home for the halflings and gnomes of Sigil. Its dimensions are built for the little folk, so anyone taller than 4 feet 6 inches has to drink their cider outside. 
The Tier of the Bar Guest is an expensive tavern favored by moneylenders, landlords, and those seeking thoughtful conversation more than drink. The Iron Heart is a popular spot with the Faded, known for its almond brandy. The Sullen Moon, a tavern of abstract sculptures and dogskin rugs, attracts tieflings. The Eyes of Elysium serves only water imported from Thalassia, the water layer of Elysium. The Blackwind Tavern is a place of dark wood and velvet curtains that enforces a strict policy of silence. Hester's Arms is a warm and friendly tavern whose central location in the ward makes it a very popular spot, almost always booked to capacity. The Slumbering Lamb is a boarding house with extremely cheap rooms. The Velvet Harness caters to Baryar with its grain troughs and floor mattresses. The Whole Note Inn features singing maids, perfumed sheets, and exotic dishes. And the Silver Spire is a tower and inn in Little Arcadia where only Celestials may enter. The lower ward is the most industrial of the wards. The air is thick with burning smog, and the streets are narrow, dirty, and crowded. This is the ward of the working class. Long ago, it used to be called the Prime Ward, because the Sod Killers and Incantarium, prominent factions of the time, herded newcomers from the Prime Material Plane here so they'd stay out of their way. Of course, Primes are often called the Clueless, and the Clueless didn't like being restricted like this, so they revolted in an event known as the Clueless Rebellion. You see, they discovered that most of the portals in this ward lead to the lower planes, so they began opening them as often as possible, letting whatever they could into the city. The resulting chaos drew the attention of the Lady of Pain. The more dangerous and mindless fiends were mazed or sent back to their home planes, and the restrictions on movement placed on primes through the city were lifted. The ward then became known as the Lower Ward, due to its preponderance of portals to the lower planes, which to this day contribute to the dangerous fumes that permeate the area, and to the higher concentration of fiends that you can find here. It's located between the Ladies Ward and the Hive Ward, and has shrunk over the years, as it used to include the Armory and Mortuary. The Lower Ward is comprised of a few districts, such as the Shattered Temple District, the Foundry District, the Central District, and Swordhold as well as a few racial neighborhoods like Little Bytopia, a gnome neighborhood, Gurrenkrag, a dwarf neighborhood, Hellgate, a Beatezu neighborhood, and Gear Street, a Modron neighborhood. The Great Foundry is the heart of the ward, and is home to the Believers of the Source, or the Mind's Eye in 5th edition, where they craft metal tools needed by everyone throughout Sigil. The Great Foundry, like really all the faction headquarters, is a massive, imposing building with large wrought iron gates and metalwork and smokestacks ten stories high. The largest and most central building in the Foundry is the Mithril Tower, an unbearably hot, noisy place flooded with light by enormous windows. The region in and around the Foundry, called the Foundry District, is where the city's smog is thickest and most harmful. By day, the Foundry obscures the sky with smoke and steam and by night, it illuminates the district with its roaring fires. The streets are a jumbled weave of workshops and taverns where craftsmen jealously guard their trade secrets. The Shattered Temple, once a temple devoted to Eosgar, god of portals, called the Great Temple of Doors, is now the home of the Athar. The Shattered Temple is a giant, domed building, though the dome has long been destroyed, and never rebuilt. The Athar prefer it that way. It's not just the temple that's destroyed, but a zone of destruction several blocks across, with the temple in the center. This area, called the Shattered Temple District, is considered ill-omened by most, and transportation services often won't enter it. And for good reason, because this area has now and again been haunted by the spirits of the angry dead. Beneath the Shattered Temple, the Athar keep a storehouse of magical items and weaponry confiscated from other temples, and the ruinous condition of the temple is a bit of an illusion, as the temple walls are magically reinforced. At the center of the temple stands the Bois Verduris, or called the Luminous Arbor in 5th edition, a giant enchanted tree that absorbs the power of magical items destroyed during Athar rituals. The tree, believed to be a gift from the Great Unknown, then stores this power which the Athar can use later, either by touching its glowing bark or by using its fruit. The ditch, which defines the border between the Hive Ward and the Lower Ward, is Sigil's only large body of water, and a popular place to dump corpses. Its corrosive waters render the bodies dumped here completely unrecognizable after just a few hours, their features smoothed over like wax dolls held to a flame. It's said that the ditch is a backwater tributary of the River Styx, though not everyone believes that. 
Its waters are normally still, sluggish, and brown. Though every once in a while, a portal from the River Oceanus opens to clean it out, a cause for celebration among the residents of the neighboring wards. Merchants and guild workers use the ditch by day to ferry material from the Great Foundry to portals to various gate towns, but they all leave by night for fear of the Ditch Beast, which in reality is an illusion created by the Dabas, who use the ditch at night as a dumping ground. The ditch is also the gathering ground of many of Sigil's were-rats, led by a shadow fiend named Tattershade, who make their home in secret tunnels in Undersigil, with the entrance located in the sewer pipes by the ditch. There's also a cavern complex along the banks of the ditch, called the Bones of the Night. Its entrance is a gaping hole in a fire-gutted building, a rope ladder with rungs of bone leading down into the darkness. The Bones of the Night is a repository of secret knowledge owned by a necromancer named Lothar the Old, more commonly known as the Master of Bones. The place is a complex of catacombs, a library of skulls that the Master of Bones consults for the knowledge they had in life. He pays well for the skulls of important or surpassingly knowledgeable people, such as a faction's factol. Most of his servants that fetch bones for him are were-rats, on loan from Tattershade, who gains knowledge in exchange for his were-rat's assistance, though a powerful stone golem also watches over the bones of night to stop would-be thieves. The Society of the Luminiferous Aether is a gentleman's club for working mages, once in the ladies' ward, but now in the lower ward, as the society's members have accepted more and more commissions from the smithies. The inside contains a vast library of spells and magical knowledge. Membership in the society costs an arm and a leg, but so does using the library if you're a guest. The place is protected by a powerful fiend that acts as a doorman, making sure that no one enters uninvited and that no works leave the library. There is another magical library in the lower ward, though this one is more bookstore than exclusive club. It's called the Parted Veil, and it's run by a gnome named Kesto Bright Eyes, who's trying to empower his customers through knowledge rather than keep it hidden like so many of the factions do. Another location in the lower ward is Harbinger House, which is a central location in a Planescape adventure of the same name. Harbinger House is a nexus of planar energy and a madhouse overseen by the godsmen, the believers of the source. More mansion than home, with an architecture right out of a chaos text dreams, with hardly a right angle in sight. The godsmen don't go out of their way to collect the insane, but they look after the ones that are brought to them. The godsmen don't believe the people under their care are crazy, but rather that they're the next generation of gods, and the pressure of ascension can take a toll. Since the lower ward is the ward of the working class, it's absolutely chock full of alehouses and taverns. The Black Sails is a tavern partially built from an ancient boat in the shadow of the armory. The Green Mill is a leafy sanctuary acting as half-tavern, half-warehouse, catering primarily to elves from the Prime Material Plane. The mill is a bright yellow-green that's cleaned regularly to keep the soot of the lower ward off. The inside feels like a forest, and its courtyard is home to some of the largest trees in the city. Not that there are many trees in Sigil to begin with. Its charm, warmth, and elegance bring a lot of visitors from the ladies' ward. The Styx Oarsman is a fiendish watering hole where no one gets in that doesn't offer a decent bribe or know the password, and the password changes daily. The common room is completely dark and serves as a place where Tanari meets and conduct their evil business. And as I mentioned earlier, Rule of Three can often be found here. The Ubiquitous Wayfarer is a tavern with over two dozen portals to the Outer Plains and other places within Sigil that allow easy travel through the city, so long as you stop for a drink first. Its portals throughout Sigil are permanently open, leading many to disagree on where the Wayfarer actually is, as many people don't even realize they're passing through a portal when they enter. The Face of Gith is a githzerai only tavern, where the patrons drink in silence, often communicating entirely through telepathy. The center of the place holds an amorphous blob of chaotic, ever-shifting material from Limbo, which the Githzerai patrons often reshape for their own amusement. In 5th edition, they're a bit more lax and allow non-Githzerai to enter, though they are still suspicious of outsiders. The Dirk and Firkin is a simple but wholesome tavern that caters to customers from the Upper Plains. The Hooded Lantern is a tavern that acts as an informal thieves' guild, the barkeep, Old Larsmith, is called the Old Worm by the patrons behind his back because of the rumors of the hoard of gold he has in the basement. The Mermaid's Cups is a local favorite due to its sexually arousing sign and even more arousing dancers. The Red Pony is a boisterous, cheap tavern for working men where bar fights are a regular source of entertainment and a chance to make a profit. 
The Speckled Rat is perhaps the cheapest tavern in the ward, and the quality matches the price. Here, the dustmen prey on indigent patrons, offering them contracts that guarantee the dustmen full use of their body after death in exchange for a few coins. The Sword and Buckler is an almost respectable establishment on the edge of the ladies' ward. Many people come here to hire thugs and bodyguards. The Tenth Pit is a tavern home to tieflings, succubi, and other fiends with a taste for blood and suffering. It's actually a popular spot for many members of the Sensates, the ones who view suffering as a valuable experience. The White Casket is a tavern for the undead and a gathering ground for the dustmen. There's a few other noteworthy spots in the ward, such as the Golden Bell and the Hands of Time. The Golden Bell is a pawn shop for the poor and desperate nearby the Temple of the Abyss, run by an alufiend named Marisha the Fox and her husband, a spy for Baphomet named Pincher the Exile. The Hands of Time is a shop of mechanical devices, looking like a slice out of Mechanus. It's a collaboration between Asimon, Modrons, and Prime Gnomes and Dwarves devoted to making the very best contraptions, gadgets, and technologies. The markets and guildhall wards, located between the clerk's ward and the ladies' ward, are technically two separate wards, but most people in Sigil don't really think of them that way. You see, long ago, before the Great Upheaval, the guilds of Sigil were many and powerful, and the guildhall ward was the most powerful ward in the city. But then the Great Upheaval happened, forcing the 49 factions to become 15, which resulted in a great strengthening of the power that each faction held. The remaining factions viewed the guilds as competitors for their power, and many of them forbade their members from being in a guild. So, many of the guilds dissolved or left Sigil. And ever since then, the Guildhall Ward has been a fraction of what it once was. There is still somewhat of a noticeable boundary between the two wards, though. The Market Ward sells goods, while the Guildhall Ward sells services. The Market Ward is where the Great Bazaar is, and the Guildhall Ward is where the Great Gymnasium is. The Market Ward is more commercial, and the Guildhall Ward is more residential. The Market Ward is the most cosmopolitan of the wards, while the Guildhall Ward has segregated racial neighborhoods. The Market Ward is a crowded cacophony of shops, stalls, and booths, and thus doesn't really have distinct districts, except for the Warehouse District, which features row upon row of storehouses. The vast majority of people who live in the Market Ward also work in the Market Ward, usually in the same building as their shop, though there are neighborhoods where the richest merchants live that would fit right in in the ladies' ward. The Guildhall Ward has the Gymnasium District, as well as a Githyanki neighborhood called Gitraban or Githaraban, an elf neighborhood with no official name but frequently called the Forest, even though it just looks like any other part of Sigil, a Barriar neighborhood named Gunderhavel, and a halfling neighborhood named Curlyfoot. The Great Gymnasium is the home of the Transcendent Order, and acts as a gym, training facility, and bathhouse. It's perhaps the most luxurious of all the faction headquarters, as the ciphers take their relaxation as seriously as their physical training. It's a huge compound built of gold and rose-veined marble. There are pools and baths, exercise fields, saunas, massage tables, meditation chambers, centers for music and art, sensory deprivation rooms, gyms, training rooms, and more. Weapons are not allowed, and magic is only allowed in special chambers for practicing spellcasting. The Great Gymnasium is known as a place of calm, where in most areas sounds louder than a whisper are discouraged. It's seen as a neutral ground by the factions of Sigil, so many treaties have been signed here. Ciphers, members of the Transcendent Order, have free access to the Great Gymnasium, whereas it's only open to others for a few hours a day. Unlike many other faction headquarters, there are no living quarters here. Instead, many ciphers live in the neighborhood surrounding the Great Gymnasium. Despite its decline, the Guildhall Ward is still home to some guilds. There's the Council of Innkeepers, the Builders' Fellowship, the Escort Guild, an organization of touts, not prostitutes, though you've got to imagine there are many prostitutes in Sigil, the Guild of Teamsters, and the Order of Master Clerks and Scribes. Back before the Great Upheaval, the more powerful guilds were the Stoneworkers, the Freemen, which included carpenters, masons, and roofers, the Leatherworkers, the Alchemists, and the Planewalkers, a sort of mercenary adventurer's guild. Many of these guilds dissolved, but the Planewalkers relocated to the Infinite Staircase, and the Alchemists still exist in Sigil today, though they've moved underground and have become the secret society of alchemy. The Great Bazaar is home to the Free League, and is where merchants of all varieties gather to sell their wares. Unlike nearly every other faction headquarters, the Great Bazaar isn't a building. 
Rather, it's mostly contained within a huge open-air plaza filled with tents, shops, wagons, and stalls. Though the Great Bazaar has no formal borders, as merchants who can't fit into the plaza set up shop right next to it. The Free League manages the space, offering merchants a place to set up shop at a reasonable price. The Great Bazaar is ever-shifting, never the same mix of sellers from week to week, but there's always enough variety that you can find someone selling literally anything you might wish to buy, at least anything that exists within the D&D universe. The place is bustling with people trying to take your money, be it merchants or pickpockets and thieves. There are a few other notable places in the market in Guildhall Wards. The Bank of Abathor is one of the largest financial institutions in the multiverse, with branches in several outer planes and prime material worlds. It's a palatial marble building manned by imp, dwarf, and zoran bank tellers and modron financial analysts. The Institute for Intellectual Excellence is a prestigious academy, one of the best places there is to learn about the wonders of the cosmos. The Planar Energy Cooperative is a giant tower overseen by wizards who monitor the magical activity of the multiverse, capable of siphoning magic from entire worlds to dampen dangerous magical artifacts that threaten the stability of the multiverse. The Bronze Byzance offers loans for large purchases, though the loans also come with large interest rates and strict deadlines for payments and harsh punishments for those who miss them, as is typical in Sigil. Ensign's Discount Elixirs sells potions with rather unimpressive effects, but at affordable prices. Zanist's shop is a block away from the Great Gymnasium, where the owner Zanist creates inventions that aren't cheap but might solve your problems. Also near the Great Gymnasium is Zack's Corpse Curing, a taxidermy shop where any kind of stuffed creature can be found, including humans, elves, whatever. Zack pays well for interesting corpses that she doesn't already have. Severed Head Weapons specializes in weapons and armor made of Beatorian green steel, a special metal imported from the wastelands of Avernus that's lighter than normal steel and can be made even sharper. High Nighter's Horses provides rentable mounts, which is quite rare in Sigil, and Nitman's Aerial Tours offers rides on flying mantas, which are basically flying carpets made of brass cut in the shape of manta rays. And as you'd expect for a ward based almost entirely on products and services, there's a wide variety of restaurants and taverns to be found. The most famous in the market ward is Chirper's. It's a giant, expensive restaurant and inn, complete with a dancing plaza, a stage featuring eight performances a day, a vast dining room, and other shops within it, such as a barber, a candy shop, a caricature artist, and a flower shop. The menu features broiled slod legs, which I find especially amusing considering slod are intelligent creatures that can be found within Sigil, at least in the hive ward. It just makes me imagine that no matter what race you are, there's some restaurant in Sigil serving your kind as food. Chirpers is also known for its skull museum and its exhibition spheres, large transparent spheres where living creatures from far-flung places in the outer plains are kept to amaze the guests. The Yawning Rat is on the opposite end of the spectrum. It's a cheap place where they serve nothing but ale hardly better than puddle water. Masties serves fine wines and attracts rich members of the Free League, the Singing Vortex is a friendly place with pricey fruit drinks that members of the Transcendent Order frequent. The Fat Candle is a dark tavern with only one light source, a candle the size of a tree trunk in the center of the room. Woodman's Retreat enforces a strict no-smoking policy, because the whole place is made of wood. It's a favorite hangout for members of the Escort Guild after a long day of guiding tourists. The Dark Sigh serves drinks that are downright deadly to anyone without fiendish blood, making it a popular place for tieflings. Dead Fingers is a dangerous place to visit, as it's home to thugs and thieves. The Turby Inn offers a cheap and dirty place to spend the night, but it's well known for its larva steak breakfasts. The larva is imported fresh from the gray waste. Yum. Feathernest Inn offers a cheap but clean place to spend the night, while Arion's Boarding House is good for longer stays. The Gastronome is an upscale eatery that looks like a giant metal olive run by a world-renowned gnome chef who never cooks the same dish twice. The Flame Pits is a bathhouse run by a Githzerai smuggler named Laurel Zaskos, where all manners of creatures come to bathe in pools of lava, liquid shadow, acid, ooze, and other liquids. This place acts as a safe haven for the Revolutionary League, and many of the tubs have false bottoms where Zaskos hides contraband or fugitives. The Red Lion Inn is a large tavern on the border of the Great Bazaar that caters to hybrid creatures such as Bariars, Centaurs, Satyrs, and Wemmicks. 
Since the Free League doesn't have an actual building as their headquarters, they use many of the inns that surround the Great Bazaar as safe houses, the Red Lion Inn included. The Hive Ward, located between the Lower Ward and the Clerk's Ward, is without a doubt the worst of the wards. It's by far the poorest, most chaotic, dirtiest, most dangerous, and nightmarish of the wards. It's a dismal collection of dirt-caked slums more fit for vermin than people. Imagine scooping up a thousand buildings in a sack, shaking them around, dumping them out, and then stomping on them. That's something like what the Hive Ward looks like. The streets wind in random directions, many of them seemingly going nowhere, dead ends in more ways than one. Space is hard to come by, so new structures are built right on top of old ones, making buildings look like a stack of boxes about to collapse. Rain is more common in this ward than in the rest of Sigil, and the rain gutters are clogged with garbage, causing mud pools to swell up, some as big as small lakes. There are also ooze puddles that are actually portals to the para-elemental plane of ooze, and stepping in one is a sure death, unless you've got friends to pull you out before it's too late. Sometimes the bony fingers of ooze mephits reach out from the puddles to grasp the legs of passers-by and suck them in, and sometimes the puddles spew noxious gas, poisoning anyone nearby. The dreary atmosphere is exacerbated by the fact that this ward has fewer light boys than anywhere else in Sigil. The Harmonium patrols here less frequently than other wards, and it's also neglected by the Dabas. The ward is full of beggars, murderers, thieves, thugs, the sick and dying, and plenty of corpses and corpse collectors hoping to make a few coins by turning them into the mortuary. At least the decaying bodies don't lay in the streets for too long. In this ward, you're likely to find fiends and the more monstrous races such as orcs, goblins, and trolls. The Hive Ward is also just called the Hive though it's not to be confused with the section of slums in the ward that the Chaosatex use as their headquarters, also called the Hive, which is why I prefer to just always call it the Hive Ward. This ward is, for the most part, a place of death, despair, and misery. Though there is a section of opulence in the Hive Ward, it's called the Marble District, and about 2% of the ward's population lives here. The marble homes don't look very impressive from the outside, all dingy and covered in razor vine the better to not call attention to the lavishly furnished interiors. There's the Dead District, also called the Grey District, which surrounds the mortuary, and it may be the cleanest and safest place in the ward. The Chaos District is home to the Chaosatex, where the Hive is located. The Madhouse District surrounds the Gatehouse, and unlike most of the ward, is rather wide and open. The Slags is the absolute worst area of the Hive. And then there's a few racial neighborhoods. Darkwell Court is an isolated and bland home to Githzerai. Casta Row is home to lizard men known as Castas. New Tyr is home to primes from the world of Athas. And Goatswood is also home to primes, refugees from a dying world called Renace. In 5th edition, the Sandstone District of the Clerk's Ward is part of the Hive Ward, and renamed the Sandstone Strip. And I should note that the ditch that forms the border between the Hive Ward and the Lower Ward is considered by many to be part of the Hive Ward not the lower ward. The mortuary is the home of the Dustmen, or as they're called in 5th edition, the Heralds of Dust, and it's where most of Sigil's dead are interred or cremated, at least the ones deposited here by the corpse collectors. Many of the poor of Sigil are collectors, Dustmen namers who roam the city, especially the Hive Ward, with corpse carts and deliver the bodies to the mortuary for a few coins apiece. The mortuary is a low, menacing dome with spikes radiating from the center, giving it the appearance of an enormous insect. In 5th edition, it looks a bit different. It's a collection of domed towers looking a bit like spiky mushrooms. The halls are filled with the undead, and outsiders normally aren't allowed inside unless they're here for a funeral or they're dead themselves. Everyone knows the dustmen run the mortuary, but what most people don't know is that they quietly run the entire ward. The gatehouse is the home of the Bleak Cabal and acts as a refuge for the Hive Ward's severely downtrodden and mentally disturbed. It's a long building with a massive central gate. It was originally called Bedlam Blight, a place to house the contagious, until the Bleakers took over 500 years ago. The gatehouse has four wings. The almshouse wing, which feeds and houses the starving and homeless. The insane asylum and orphanage wing, with the insane asylum on the first two floors and the orphanage on the third the criminally and irretrievably insane wing that houses the absolute worst of Sigil, and the mad bleaker wing, which houses members of the bleak cabal who come down with a case of the grim retreat, which is when the futility of it all drives them to madness. 
there's also a fenced garden surrounding the gatehouse. Because the Bleak Cabal have been doing this for quite some time, they've actually learned quite a lot about mental health and have a pretty good success rate for patient recovery. Though the gatehouse has a limited capacity in how many patients it can treat at a time, so there's practically always an extremely long line outside. 5th edition makes the gatehouse out to be a place where people come to be treated for plainer afflictions, such as those who have been warped by Demon Icker or have been cursed by Layer of the Abyss. Nearby the gatehouse is the gatehouse night market. While you can find anything for sale in the Great Bazaar, this is where you should come if you're specifically looking for more questionable purchases. Things like poisons, murderers for hire, fences, slaves, forged documents, whatever you need with no questions asked, the night market is the place to come. The Hive is the home of the Chaosatex. It doesn't offer any service to the people of Sigil. It's a chaotic jumble, a sprawl of slums, abandoned warehouses, and decaying shanties, where buildings fall daily only to be replaced by new, temporary structures. The Chaosatex just kind of hang out in this whole area, though they do sometimes burn violet torches using a special oil imported from Limbo to alert each other to their presence. There are a few places aside from the gatehouse that cater to the needy in this ward. Alesha's pantry is a charity kitchen set up in an abandoned warehouse. Alesha doesn't make very good food, but it is free. There's also the Weary Spirit Infirmary, where injuries and maladies are treated free of charge, though to be honest, the place is equal parts hospital and torture house. You're practically guaranteed to suffer extreme agony here, and you're pretty likely to die. But hey, your surgery might be successful, and it's free. And don't worry, even if you're just here for a fever or stomach cramps, you're getting surgery. You see, the doctor, Ridnir Tetch, doesn't really care if a patient lives or dies. He just likes to see what happens when he tinkers with people's innards. The corpses are thrown into a deep pool of brown rainwater out back named Boneyard Pond. Not far from Alush's pantry is the Scratch Wall, a giant stone wall a block long that marks the boundary of the slags, covered by the engravings of countless citizens of the ward. It's all that's left over of the protective bulwark the citizens built around the slags to keep the fiends contained when the blood war spilled into Sigil a long time ago. The slags used to be just like any part of the Hive Ward, until a few millennia ago when a portal opened up to a blood war battleground and the Tanari and Beatezu got it into their heads that the portal was a gift from their gods that led to a powerful weapon in Sigil. Needless to say, there was no weapon, and the weeks of fighting in the Hive Ward left this area completely destroyed. The effects remain to this day. It's still an expanse of ash, sewage, and smoldering debris. Most people don't bother rebuilding because the lingering magical effects of the invasion cause continual earthquakes. Vargwheels, flesh-eating heads with wings, roam the skies in the area, and slobbering dretches wander the streets. There's also a mysterious monster known as Cadix. Those who have seen more than a passing glimpse of it can't report what they saw because they were eaten soon after. Though people are still drawn to the slags, either because they're hiding out and they fear Cadix less than they fear the law, or because they're drawn by the rumors of ancient Tanari supply caches holding magical treasures. There are also occasional vortices that lead to the prime material plane in this area that look like swirling spirals of red mist. The Hive Ward is also home to a great many taverns and pubs, though most of them rather dirty, dangerous, and run down. One of the most popular, and certainly the most notorious, is the Bottle and Jug, the B&J looks more like a fortress than a tavern, and the inside holds a massive fighting pit hidden behind the doors of an out-of-order bathroom. Tickets are required to watch a match, which are usually fought to the death against the owner's prized fighter, a bloodthirsty cyclops named Akra. The Grease Pit is an alley featuring street food from all across the Outer Plains. Though I will say, I don't really like this art of the Grease Pit, because it makes the Hive Ward look colorful and lively and friendly and safe, which is the exact opposite of what it's supposed to be. Though I suppose not every section of the ward has to be that way. The smoldering corpse bar is named for the perpetually burning body of a mage named Ignis that floats in the middle of the taproom. Though he's not actually a corpse, but rather has been transformed into a living portal to the elemental plane of fire, a punishment for attempting to burn down the entire hive ward. Fittingly, in 5th edition, Ignis was a member of the Hands of Havoc. The Snapped Finger is known for its nightly fights and complete lack of furniture. Benny's Tap Room is actually a pretty nice place in the Marble District. The Butcher's Block brings in all sorts of criminals and is a good place to gather intel, if you've got the bribe money. Shrinker's is known for the skin rat chained to the wall. 
Those who get drunk enough are encouraged to drink some of the skin rat's sweat, which shrinks the imbiber, thus the name. Zero is a favorite spot for the bleak cabal, where you may get served an empty pitcher. Quake's place is set up in the hive, and caters to chaos attacks by constantly rearranging and repainting the walls, replacing the furniture, changing the name, and even moving to different buildings. There are plenty of other businesses in the hive ward, such as Parak Pest, which is a cranium rat exterminator business, or at least it appears to be. But really, the Gitzeri Parak is collecting cranium rats and adding them to the Us, a godlike hive mind of cranium rats in Undersigil. Greenstone Gables is one of the very few mount suppliers in Sigil, though while the mounts sold and rented here are cheap, they're also riddled with defects and likely to drop dead on you. There's also Orismonder's Meats, selling meats of all origin, a good place to go if the mount you bought from Greenstone Gables dies. The Blood Pit is the most famous fighting arena in the city, concealed by a series of run-down warehouses. And then there's Fell's Tattoos, Remember when I said that the worship of Eoskar reached such heights in the city of Doors that even Adabas became a priest? That was Fel. It seems as a punishment for worshipping the dead god of portals, Fel lost his ability to levitate and was banished from the Daba's warrens beneath Sigil, though he still can speak in rebuses. He can also imprint those rebuses into people's skin, and so he opened a tattoo parlor. Though sometimes the images jump off the skin and come to life, which in some cases can actually be pretty useful. Unlike other Dabas, Fell is quite social and friendly. In 2nd edition, his tattoo shop is in the Market Ward, but in 5th edition, it's here in the Hive Ward. Undersigil is the name for the interconnected labyrinthine tunnels that run beneath the streets of Sigil, though most cagers don't call it Undersigil. Instead, they refer to it as the Realm Below, or the Catacombs, or the Labyrinths, not to be confused with the mazes. For the most part, it's even more dangerous and chaotic than the Hive Ward. Some people in Sigil think that the Taurus isn't thick enough to account for the size of this subterranean domain, and so think that Under Sigil isn't even beneath Sigil at all, but rather that the entrances to the tunnels are actually portals to some other plane. Under Sigil is where the Dabos seem to live. I say seem to because the Dabos warrens are completely inaccessible to non dabas when the Dabas are done with their work for the day, they enter the tunnels leading down into Undersigil and vanish somewhere down there, so it's assumed this is where they have some sort of home or headquarters or base or whatever. The most common passages into Undersigil are through sewers and crypts, though there aren't many crypts in Sigil. There are also entrances from some taverns and shops, like the Twelve Factals in the Ladies Ward or the Bones of the Knights in the Lower Ward. The realm below is filled with cranium rats, were rats, and undead creatures such as ghouls. Whispers speak of four groups of cranium rats that war with each other, called the Four Great Mines. There are a few noteworthy places in Undersigil. The Dead Nations is an expanse of derelict necropolises or necropoli and forgotten tombs ruled over by the Silent King. The Silent King's throne comes with a curse. It grants power and authority over the undead in the realm below but it also acts as a prison. Only one of the living may sit on the throne, and only death may free the Silent King from it. The Drowned Nations is a flooded region of sickening reservoirs and swampy tunnels that connect them. There's a portal to the elemental plane of water in the depths that acts as a drain, though it's usually clogged with sewage, sometimes causing flooding in the streets above. The place is inhabited by Kuotoa, Troglodytes, Sahuagin, and other aquatic monsters. There's also an ancient Aboleth living down there named Abadum. His lair is vast, and he holds some of Sigil's darkest secrets. The Loop is a circular tunnel that connects to various portals through Under Sigil, though the portals lead only in and not out. So be careful entering portals in the realm below, because you may find yourself in the Loop with no way out. Although sometimes people do escape it somehow. Though the Loop is not beholden to laws of time and space, you might see your own back as you wander, and exiting the loop might hurl you into the distant past or future. The Warrens of Thought is home to the Us, also called Many as One, the largest cranium rat collective in Sigil. It's a hive mind of godlike intelligence that has severed its connection and servitude to the godbrain Ilsensine. These Warrens are beneath the slags in the hive ward, where cranium rats are brought by Parak to be added to the Us. Rats that refuse are killed and eaten. Its ultimate goal is to destroy Ilsensine, and then perhaps to surpass the Lady of Pain in intelligence and power. Nowhere is a town under the city, 
It's a cluster of ramshackle tenements that act as refuge for criminals and fallen factions. Some factions consisting of just one member that refuses to let their philosophy die. The Factals here hope to rekindle interest in their factions so that they may once again emerge to the streets and hold a place in the Hall of Speakers. The Coterie of Cakes is one faction found in nowhere, and the Undivided are another. Plus, in 5th edition, the Revolutionary League fell away to disorganization and can now be found here. And that's about all there is to say about Sigil. Of course, it isn't. There's more I could say. I didn't describe every character in the city or every named building or every detail, but the goal of this video was to be the most comprehensive video on Sigil there is without becoming tedious. And I'm sure for some people I've crossed that line. This video is certainly longer than I expected it to be when I set out to make it. I thought it'd be like 45 minutes, and I thought it would be relatively quick to make, but it turns out there's quite a lot written about Sigil, far more than there is about most of the Otter Plains. There's at least three entire second edition books dedicated to fleshing out Sigil, and many more that offer several more details, and a fifth edition book that's half about the city. I told this to my patrons a while ago, but the main reason I made a video about Sigil instead of one of the Outer Plains is because I figure I've already covered the two Outer Plains with the most mass appeal, the Nine Hells and the Abyss, and I thought that I'd better make another wide appeal video before going into planes that less people are interested in. That way when I make those videos, I can perhaps have a higher subscriber count and get more views on them than I otherwise would. If you'd like to help me make these videos and make them faster, then please consider supporting me on Patreon. And let me know down in the comments what you'd like my next video topic to be. Maybe Elysium? Maybe Mechanus? An in-depth look at a particular faction? A critique of the turn of fortune's wheel? Something else? Let me know. But I hope you enjoyed this video, and thank you for watching.